Hey, and welcome to this tutorial on how to use the ANSYS version of the Bergstrom voice model. Uh, so this is a continuation of my uh, last two videos where I talked about calibrations of material models for peak polyether E3 ketone. And today I'm going to focus on the ANSYS version of the Bergstrom voice model. Uh, the, the BB model uh, has uh, two parallel networks. And uh, you can see a rheological representation of the model here and a screenshot of the ANSYS documentation for it. Uh, this is a model that I developed um, a number of years ago when I studied uh, uh, for my PhD work. And it was developed for elastomer-like materials, but you can still apply it for other polymers, uh, but it works particularly well for softer polymers. In this example, of course, we're focusing on, on PEAK, which is a very stiff thermoelastic uh, plastic material. So it, it may not be the best choice, but we'll try and see what it works like in this case. Uh, this is a native material model for ANSYS. It's easy to use. It's easy to calibrate, as I will demonstrate here. And it can be very much uh, more accurate than any of the linear viscoelastic models that people sometimes try for polymers. Um, um, so what I want to do here is to talk a little bit first about uh, the theory for this model. And uh, so the easiest way to do that is to uh, simply go to the polymerfm.com website and we click on the question mark and we go to BB for the BB model and uh, we'll find um, uh, this particular article here that talks about the, the theory behind the model a little bit. Uh, we don't need to go in through the details here, but it's good to have a feeling for what this is all about. And if you are particularly interested, you can uh, keep reading this document at some other time. So here's the two network representation again. So there's two hyperelastic components that you need to specify through experimental data. And uh, each of these have a shear modulus and a bulk modulus uh, associated with them. But you can also see that the stiffness of the second, the response of the second hyperelastic element, is simply a factor S times the properties of the first one. So that's a way to reduce the number of parameters that you need to find. And uh, there's just one parameter for the second hyperelastic network here. Uh, the flow response is given by a, a flow element that's shown there. So if we scroll down, we can see that uh, here's the equation for the flow element. The rate of viscoelastic flow here is given by this equation. And there are a few different parameters that needs to be obtained from the experimental data. Uh, so that's kind of the, the little bit about the background. Let's just jump right into our example here to see if we can demonstrate how this works in practice. So I'm going to open up some experimental data. This is the same data that we have used in my other videos when I talk about peak. Uh, so it's going to open these four experimental files. You'll see that they are uh, very typical. They have time in column one, engineering strain in column two, and engineering stress in column three. And all these files have the same structure. So uh, to use this, we simply, uh, well, we can copy on them. So I right click on it and I say copy. And then I open up my M calibration window and I say edit, paste. And uh, that will automatically also read in the data for us. And here is, you can see the data in tension and compression uh, as shown here. So to calibrate this model, we can simply say set material model. And then we scroll down to the section about ANSYS. Here's the ANSYS section. ANSYS Bergstrom Boys is one of my recommended models for ANSYS. And here are the parameters that are uh, needs to be found from the experimental data in this case. So I say OK. And here you can see them. There are eight numbers that we need to get from experimental data. And when you do this, it's good to think a little bit about what are these parameters, which of these parameters are uh, fixed, and which of them needs to be searched for. Um, I always struggle a little bit with the D parameter, which is related to the bulk response of the material. In this case, we have uniaxial tension, we have compression data. But we don't have information about the D parameter. The D parameter is really defined as 2 divided by the bulk modulus, which in turn is also given by the shear modulus of the response. So it's a little bit complicated. I usually simply specify that by adding additional information here in the terms of a Poisson's ratio load case. 
So I switch over here, I set the Poisson's ratio. What's the Poisson's ratio of peak? Well, it's around 0 0.4 small strains. So I'm going to say, save this. And that gives me one more data point that I can use to find out what the D parameter should be. Instead of guessing something, I will use this load case to guide that for me. So I add this, I select it to be optimized by clicking on this checkbox, and now we're good to go. This is really all we need to do in this case to set up the calibration. So if I run it one time, you'll see that the prediction uh, is not that super great, uh, but it's just a starting point. Here, here it is. Um, to save time, um, what I will do is I will switch over to my saved calibrated answer. This is just a, the starting point. We can calibrate it as usual, but I will just switch to my saved solution because there's some uh, interesting things going on here that is worth talking about. So I'm opening this up. So this is what I got when I ran this for a little bit. Uh, the fitness ended up being about 17.6, which means that the average error between the experimental data and the model predictions were about 17%, which is not all that great. Uh, you can see that also in the data that it, it's missing some of the behaviors uh, to some extent. Uh, so you look at unloading and reloading, there is no hysteresis under cyclic loading here. And that's the restriction uh, or problem because we have a two-network uh, viscoelastic material model. In my other videos, I talked about three network models. They tend to have better predictions of cyclic responses uh, than what we can get with the BB model here. But it's still, it's a pretty reasonable agreement with the data. There is one problem though, and this is what I wanna highlight here. And that is, if you look very carefully, you'll see that this is the best overall fit that we can get to this data set. But if we look carefully at smaller strain by zooming in here, we'll see that intention ending in compression that the predictions are dashed lines here the experimental data are solid lines and there's a very large difference in the initial modulus between the model predicted uh, the, the model predictions as calibrated and the experimental data and it's kind of is perhaps at first like why well, strange well, why does this model give us such a poor prediction of the initial modulus and when you think about it it's pretty clear why right because it needs to at, at to calibrate um, to all the data at once. And there's a lot of information about cyclic response here, and it, uh, it sacrifices the small strain modulus prediction in order to get better predictions of the unloading response, particularly in compression in this case. And that's something that may be something you like, but many times that's something I really don't like, because if you have a, a part that you, you're interested in, you deform it a little bit perhaps, and then what it means that initially in regions where, which are not stressed up to say beyond yield or anything, the stress strain response will be much too soft. I think it's better to at least have the modulus response correctly and then after that try to get the yield response, not to sacrifice um, the initial response in order to get the unloading correct. So that's something you can do using M calibration. I will show you how you can achieve that. Uh, one easy way to do that, and open another file to demonstrate that, uh, we'll just open this one, is to add another load case. Uh, this is a Young's modulus load case. So if you open this one up, you see under load case type, you can say, I want to use a, a E modulus load case, it's called here. When you do that, you can specify what the Young's modulus you like to be at a certain strain value. So I said 3,500 megapascals in this case, and that gives me predictions that are more in line with the actual slope of the curve here. So if I run this calibration, you will see that now the, the, the software will search for mu A and mu B, and it can take any value it likes, but it will attempt to do so with, with the additional constraint and they want to minimize the difference between the predicted Young's modulus and 3,500. So that's a good way to sort of impose a constraint on that during calibration. And if you do that, you get a fitness value that's actually worse overall than what we got when we didn't have that constraint. That's very typical. When you add a constraint to an optimization, you tend to reduce the overall fitness, but it gives us at least a better fit where we care about it, which is in this case, to the small strain modulus. So that's the, the, the approach that I want to highlight here. But sometimes that's useful to do. 
particularly with material models, they can't really predict everything that you want. There's some other material models that I talked about in some of my other videos for this data set that can do this better. But if you want to use the ANSYS BB model, I, I typically would do this uh, Young's modulus uh, approach that I just talked about here. So, so that's how you would calibrate this model. If you want to use it in ANSYS, you simply need to export it to an APDL file format. And uh, I've already done that, so I don't need to do it again. So if we go back to our uh, folder here, we'll see that uh, the data that we were given were actually at four different temperatures. I demonstrated the, the room temperature data at 296 Kelvin, but we also had data at 373, 423, or 473 Kelvin, just like in the other examples that I talked about in the previous videos. Uh, we don't need to go through this four times. Uh, all I will do here is to open up one of these save files um, to show what it looks like. Let's just pick the, like one of the higher temperatures here. And here it is. See that the response under these conditions looks a little different. At elevated temperature, the modulus goes down a little bit. The yield stress goes down a little bit. But overall, the response looks somewhat similar uh, besides that. Uh, so this is the best I could calibrate with this modulus uh, constraint in place here. Um, so, so that's how you use and calibrate the ANSYS BB model. There's one last step that I want to talk about here, and that's related to how do you make this model temperature dependent? Say you want to simulate a, a procedure or a part that undergoes a temperature dependent load history. So you want to combine all of these calibrations into one a temperature dependent model. So to do that, you would do the preci precisely what I did here. You calibrate the model to each temperature first, one in term. For each temperature, you export it to a data file by clicking save, and then you save it as a DAT file. And once you've done that, you will have these files here, and I have my four files here. I can just open them up just to demonstrate what's in these files. Uh, it has the ANSYS APDL commands. So here is TB, comma, BB. So that's how you define the Birds and Boys model in ANSYS. And there are two, two parts of it. It's the, the, the deviatoric and the volumetric parts. And you have this. And this needs to be combined into different temperatures. And that's something you can very quickly do with M calibration again. So to demonstrate that, I will just open a new window here. I guess I'll close the old one. I'll go to Calibrate, I'll go to Set the Material Model, I scroll down to ANSYS, but this time I don't pick the Bergstrom Boys, I'm going to pick ANSYS Template. So in the Template section here, there is one choice called Temperature Dependent BB. If I click on that, the software will ask you for these exported files, and we have four of them in this case. I open these, and here they are. Now what M Calibration does is that it combines these into the proper format for a temperature-dependent BB model. This is something, of course, that you could, could have done by hand if you like, but this is how you, uh, you use it if you use the M calibration implementation of it, which is very fast and, and easy to use, as I demonstrated. I can save this. Um, there is one step here that we need to do if you use this. We need to specify what these four temperatures are, because we gave the files, but we didn't say what each file corresponds to. Uh, so I'm just going to enter these temperature values here. It's 296, 373, 423, 473. Um, so that's that's what they are. This is very similar to what we did for the temperature-dependent uh, polyumod models and the temperature-dependent ANSYS PRF model that I talked about in previous videos. But this is how you would do it with ANSYS Bergstrom Boys model. Uh, to see if this works, we'll try it with a load case. So I will add a virtual load case here. Um, I'm going to yes, tell the software to pull it to 50% strain and tension at some temperature. Let's just pick 293. It uh, doesn't really matter. I save here. And then I'll click Run Once. And then we'll see what happens. I think the software now uh, will launch ANSYS in the background. Uh, create a simulation and run it for us and then plots the results here. So this is the, the stress strain prediction for this multi-temperature version of the 
a Bergstrom voice model. You can export it if you want to use it in ANSYS. I was going to call it multi that. And here it is. Double click on this one. You'll see this is the actual file that you would use in ANSYS after this. It has all the temperature and all the parameters for you. Uh, and that's the, that's the procedure. The last thing I just want to mention uh, here is related to uh, the accuracy, is to compare this to the results we have from the other videos, right? So we, we have a lot of data for this peak. It's kind of interesting. Four temperatures, uh, tension and compression. And we started by talking about the Abacus PRF model. Right? And the Abacus PRF model predicts these values. The average error was 12.6%, which is not too bad. Um, and then I had another video where I talked about the TNV model. This is a model in the polyhumod library. I ended up with an error that was significantly better, uh, about 37% better. Uh, and that was a model that was specifically for thermoplastics that has some more features than the PRF model. And today, I present two different versions of the BB model, depending on what constraints I impose on the Young's modulus. So if I let uh, the Young's modulus be whatever it wants, then I get an error of about 12, 20%, which is not too bad, but it's not as good as the PRF or the TNV model. If I, if I force the modulus to have more realistic values, then the, the error, error will increase, of course. Um, so, so this is a little disappointing to see these errors being larger uh, for the BB model than the PRF models or the TNV model. And as I mentioned, that's because of the two network representation versus the three network representation that are used in the other models. But you can certainly use this uh, for other polymers. You can also use it for the, the peak uh, material, as I demonstrated here. Uh, but you have that limitation in the accuracy, particularly during cyclic loading beyond yield. Um, so that's all I want to talk about here. Uh, let me know if you have any questions.